Hi everyone, I'm Yin Zhang. In this talk, I will talk about fine grain complexity and algorithms for the shoes mode voting method. This is joint work with Christoph Sonnet and Virginia Williams. The shoes method is a single winner voting rule defined on ordinal preference bullets. Um, and it was introduced by Schultz back in 2003. This is introduced by modifying the um, Mimax color set voting rule because the Mimax color set voting rule does not satisfy some um, important properties, but now Schultz method um, does satisfy these properties such as clone independence, reversal symmetry, and uh, the Smith criteria. And now this, the Schultz method is used broadly in many organizations. In order to define Schultz method, um, let's first look at the definition of weighted majority graph. There are n voters and n candidates, and in this talk, we'll assume n is roughly n. Each voter has a preference list over candidates. We define muv to be the number of voters who prefer u over v, and the weighted majority graph is a directed complete graph over um, whose vertex set is a set of candidates. And the edge weight of the edge from u to v equals muv minus mvu. So let's take a look at, at an example. Um, in this example, there are four voters and four candidates. Uh, we can create the matrix M from this preference lists. If we look at the entry on the eighth row and B's column, then since voter one and voter two prefer A over B, the value in that entry is two. We can similarly verify all other entries as well. So given the matrix M, we can easily define the weight of the majority graph by, um, for instance, the edge weight of the edge from A to B is zero because MAB minus MBA is zero. So now, since uh, the edge weights of the opposite edges always sum up to zero, uh, we can remove one of these two edges in, in our figures to make the um, figures look simpler. So um, given the weighted majority graph, the Schultz method is defined as, um, as the following. So the bottleneck path from U to V is a path whose minimal edge weight is largest. And we use B U V to denote the minimal edge weight of the bottleneck path. And the Schultz winner is a candidate U such that B U V is uh, greater or equal to B V U for every V. And uh, if B V U B U V is greater or equal to B V U, we say U beats V. Okay. So in this example, uh, we can compute the bottleneck path weights. So for instance, say um, if we are interested in the bottleneck pass weight of the path from A to B, then the best pass is for A first to go to first go to C, and then um, from C we go to B. And uh, since both edges we used have weight two, then the bottleneck is two, and uh, we can verify that this is in fact the best edge. So in this example, the only shoes winner is A. In fact, shoes show that. There are, um, there's always a shoes winner, and uh, sometimes there could be multiple shoes winners. Now, let me introduce fine grained complexity and uh, motivations for fine grained complexity and why fine grained complexity is useful in our setting. So, the study of fine grained complexity is to relate different, uh, simulate different problems um, that are from different air areas via fine grained reductions. So an efficient reduction from a problem B to a problem A will show that if there is an O P n to the power of one minus epsilon time algorithm for problem A for some positive epsilon, then there is an O Q n to the power of one minus delta time algorithm for problem B for delta greater than zero. So essentially, it means that if we can improve problem A, um, then we can also improve problem B. So sometimes fine grained reductions can be viewed as hardness results. Say, imagine if we have a popular and old problem B that doesn't have any improvements for decades, um, and we show a reduction from a problem B from the problem B to problem A. Then that means um, improving problem A will mean a breakthrough for problem B. And since problem B doesn't have any improvements for decades, uh, it suggests that improving problem A um, is probably very hard. 
Okay, so there are some examples of fine grained complexity. Um, Backroots and index show the reduction from CNF set to edit distance. Um, essentially, that reduction will show um, if there is an O into two minus epsilon time algorithm for computing the edited, edited distance between two lengths and strings, and uh, then there will be an O two to the one minus delta um, time algorithm for CNF set with n variables and O n clauses. And since CNF set is a very old and well studied problem, um, and it doesn't have faster than two to the n time algorithm, it doesn't have uh, significant, significantly faster than two to the n time algorithm. Uh, it will probably mean that a truly subquadratic sub algorithm for at a distance um, is unlikely, or at least very hard to achieve. Another example is the reduction from three sum to O address sparse triangle. And it shows that an O m to the four thirds minus epsilon time algorithm for deciding if each edge is in a triangle in an M edge graph um, will imply an O n to the two minus delta time algorithm for three sum with n numbers. Uh, where well, in three sum we want to find if there is if there is a um, triple of three numbers that sum up to zero. Note that uh, all these problems are from very different areas. For instance, seeing I've said is from um, the study of exponential time algorithms and NP completeness, while at the distance is from um, stream matching algorithms. So the hard problem um, in our work is the dominating pairs problem. So we will reduce dominating pairs to other problems and show, um, show that it's unlikely to improve uh, the Schultz method algorithms. The dominating pair problems was originally studied in computational geometry. Given two sets of points A1 through AR and B1 through BR, both in R dimensions, we want to answer whether there exists I and J such that BJ dominates AI. And that means AIK is less than or equal to BJK for every coordinate K. The best run time is OR to the power of 2.659. Um, because it uses rectangular matrix multiplication, so the exponent looks a little bit uh, weird. But uh, if we assume there is perfect algorithm for multiplying matrices, then the running time is roughly r to the 2.5 time. And this 2.5 exponent hasn't been challenged for over 30 years. So um, we also look at another harder version of dominating pair, which is the dominance product problem. In this problem, we need to compute a matrix C such that Cij equals the number of k, um, where Aik is less than or equal to Bjk. And we can see that if there is a dominating pair, if and only if C contains an entry of value R. The runtime of dominating pair and dominant product, dominance product are currently the same. So in our first result, we look at the computational complexity of computing the weighted majority graph. So this problem is not only useful in Schultz method, but also um, useful in many other voting rules. We show that computing the weighted majority graph from the preference list is fine-grained equivalent to the dominance product problem up to um, polylogarithmic factors. Uh, this equivalence will imply an O m to the 2.659 time algorithm for computing the weighted majority graph, uh, and this beats uh, a uh, naive m cube time algorithm for computing a weighted majority graph. Recall that we are assuming n and m are, are roughly the same in this talk. Um, this equivalence also shows that if we want to improve this m to the 2.659 time algorithm, um, we need to improve the dominance product problem. And that might be hard since it's only challenged for 30 years now. So even though it's hard to compute um, the weighted majority graph more efficiently, it might be possible that we can compute a Schultz winner given the preference list without computing the weighted majority graph. Um, but our second theorem says that even if we don't compute the weighted majority graph, the, um, we cannot, the algorithm cannot be much more efficient. So we show a reduction from dominating pairs to determining if a candidate is a Schultz winner from the preference list. And that suggests that it is hard to even determine if a candidate is a Schultz winner in um, 
om to the 2.5 minus epsilon time. And note that the task of determining whether a given candidate is a Schulz winner is surely easier than finding all Schulz winners, because once we have all Schulz winners, uh, we can check if the candidate is in the list of all Schulz winners. And also in our archive version, we show this theorem, but uh, we um, we show that um, dominating pairs can be reduced to finding an arbitrary Schulz winner and uh, that will complete the story of our reduction. Our second result is an uh, improvement over the folklore algorithm uh, of computing an arbitrary Schulz winner from the weighted majority graph. So given the weighted majority graph, um, it was known that we can compute a, Sch a Schulz winner in OM to the 2.687 time, but now we improve the runtime to almost linear. Okay, so in this talk, we will focus on the um, proofs of theorem one and two. And if we are interested in the proof of theorem three, um, please read our paper or ask me any questions. So in theorem one, we want to show constructing weighted majority graph is equivalent to dominance product. In the first direction, uh, we are given a preference list and we want to construct the weighted majority graph using an algorithm for dominance product as a black box. So uh, let AU A be the rank of candidate U in voter A's list. Um, if we define AU A like this, then the matrix MUV um, equals the number of voters A, where AU A is less than or equal to AVA. And uh, the task of computing the number of voters where AUA is less than or equal to AVA is exactly in the form of dominance product. So if we have a black box for computing dominance product, uh, we can use that to directly compute the matrix M. And given the matrix M, we can easily compute the edge weights of the weighted majority graph. And that completes this direction. For the other direction, we are given an instance of the dominance product um, problem. And we want to use a black box for constructing the weighted majority graph to solve the dominance product instance. And with auto, uh, with auto loss of generality, uh, we assume all coordinates are distinct. So we create two R candidates, U1 through UR and V1 through VR. And for each K, um, we create a voter K who prefers UI to VJ if and only if AIK is less than or equal to BJK. And this is possible because we can just sort um, all the values a r k and b k b j k and uh, um, order the candidates in the sorted order of these numbers. Therefore, um, since we have a black box for constructing the weighted majority graph, uh, we can compute the edge weights w u i v j, and from w m v j we can easily infer m u m u i v j. And since M U I V J is the number of voters K whose preference list has U I before V J, and by the definition of our um, preference lists, it is exactly the number of K such that A I K is less than or equal to B J K. And uh, yeah, and then we, we can easily compute the dominance product um, because M U I V J will be equal to C I J, and that completes the whole proof of theorem one. Okay, so uh, now let's go into the proof of theorem two. Recall that in theorem two, we show that dominating pairs can be fine-grained reduced to de determining if a candidate is a Schultz winner from the preference list. So given an instance of dominating pair, um, um, where there are two sets of points, A1 through AR and B1 through BR, we want to know whether the dominance product C contains an entry of value R. And uh, in this proof, we will assume that all entries of C are positive. Uh, we can achieve this by adding an extra um, coordinate to all the vectors. And in that coordinate, we set the value um, to zero for all vectors AI and set the value to one for vectors BJ. Okay, so uh, using previous ideas and some additional construction, we can create a preference list on all our voters and all our candidates uh, whose corresponding weighted majority graph will be the following graph. So in this graph, we'll have a um, set V of R vertices and a set U of R vertices. And there will be two extra vertices 
W and W prime in the middle. And we claim that if W is a shoes winner, then if and only if uh, the dominance product matrix C doesn't have an entry of value R. So assume this claim is true, then uh, we can use an algorithm for testing shoes winner to determining whether uh, there is a dominant pair. Because if we test whether W is a shoes winner, then that will tell us whether C has an entry of value R and that will solve the dominant pair problem. So it remains to prove this claim. For the first direction, uh, let's say if Cij equals R for some I and J, then we need to show that W is not a Schultz winner. So first we notice, notice that um, the bottleneck pass weight uh, from Bu to W is at least 2R because there is um, such a pass. Um, note that the weight for Cij minus 2R equals 2R because Cij equals R. And the weight of the second edge is 2R. So the weight, the bottleneck of this red pass equals 2R. And uh, since we are maximizing uh, over all the passes, um, the bottleneck pass is at least 2R. So now let's take a look at B, W, U, I. We claim that it is at most 2R minus 2. This is because this is because um, for any pass that starts at W and at, ends at UI, um, at some point we must enter. At, we must use an edge uh, whose beginning is outside of the uh, set U and uh, whose ending is inside the set U. Therefore, at some point we must use one of these three kinds of blue edges. So um, the top two kinds of blue edges apparently have weights uh, at most two R minus two for the bottom type of blue edge, um, since we assumed all, all the entries of C are positive, the bottom type of blue edges uh, have weight at most 2R minus 4. Therefore, at some point, the pass will use an edge of weight at most 2R minus 2, so the bottleneck is at most 2R minus 2. And that shows that W is not a shoes winner. The other direction uh, uses similar idea, but for the sake of time, we will um, mostly skip this proof. Okay, and if once we have the second direction proof, we um, the claim will follow. So uh, here is a summary of our results. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. <laughs>